understood the importance of setting aside opinions and to listen to the evidence in this case that's brought forth from witnesses that testify. And you indicated to all of us that with that fresh, clean slate, you hope to engage in a journey to determine the truth. It's the state's position that we will prove the charge beyond all reasonable doubt as outlined by the court of the indictment of aggravated murder with the specification of a firearm. This case is more complicated than most. As you are aware, we will present evidence of flight by the defendant, Claudia Herrick. We have a case that happened, a crime that was committed on March 12, 2007. She fled to Brazil. In fact, the evidence will show in her long statement on videotape that's been admitted for your review and will be played when this man, Detective Mike Inucci, who was at the crime scene, that she was guilty and that she should serve a sentence in Brazil to be close to her family. Objection, Your Honor. Again, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we overrule that. These are the statements of counsel. These are not evidence. Uh, please proceed. You will hear 
this defendant say she was guilty of the aggravated murder of her husband and that she should be tried and served time for that crime in Brazil and served 30 years. That's what she said. You will hear it. What is the importance of her statements? As the judges indicated, you're going to decide for yourselves what to believe that's true or not true. I'm just telling you what you're going to get is words from her mouth over a two and a half hour period and this man will testify it's the longest statement he's ever taken. But that statement was taken in 2018, January 17th. A long journey from the time Major Herod, who was a 43-year-old veteran who spent most of his life serving the United States Air Force and serving the people of this country in the defense of his country. The law. His honor is already mentioned. It's been mentioned by counsel. What does the state have to prove? the elements of the crime. March 12, 2007. She did purposefully, that is intentionally, not an accident, with prior calculation and design, cause the death of another. The law states that any person who comes to Trumbull County and commits a criminal offense is to be tried Objection in Trumbull. Objection and relevance. It, what does whether or not she has to be tried in Trumbull County have to do with the fact that's that that's the only thing that is pending? Mr. I would overrule the procedure, Mr. Blackburn. The venue of this case by law, is we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she killed her husband in Trumbull County, Ohio. Individuals who commit crime under the law in this county don't get a trial where they're caught. That's why the law provides extradition which you will hear from a U.S. Marshal and an FBI agent that they brought her back as a result of legal proceedings. Objection. To this county. Common sense. You want to use the word common sense? Under the law, and the reason we have to prove venue is Folks who live in the United States, and this is not only in the United States, it is in virtually every country. When you go to a community, and if you commit an offense, the people don't have to go all over the world and bring their witnesses and their victims to wherever they're caught. Properly and with justification and by law, the evidence is going to come out, and that's why I'm explaining it to you, that I am a prosecutor in Ohio. Sergeant Yanucci works for the Sheriff's Department, and you will hear from Sergeant Lang, who is retired. We people that are in law enforcement, once somebody leaves the state of Ohio as a fugitive, and I believe you're
Your Honor. Thank you. You will hear basically evidence from witnesses that deal with two time periods. It's a crime scene. It's the state able to charge this defendant with aggravated murder. That's 2007. But you will hear from Anthony Sano, FBI agent, William Bolden, U.S. Marshal, Deputy U.S. Marshal out of Cleveland, that pursuant to their job on January 17th, 2018, they, in a commissioned plane by the United States Marshal, went to Brazil, Brazil, and there was an exchange between the federal police of Brazil to turn her over to American authorities. And on her ride back, nine hour flight, 4,400 miles, she made admissions to Mr. Bolden and Mr. Sano. She was volunteering, volunteering information about what happened 11 years ago. You will hear that. You will also hear after she came back, approximately 9.30 in the evening of January 17th, her statement to police. I'm not going to go into that statement. I've already touched upon part of it. But I would characterize it as very long, a statement that contradicts the reality of 2007, and a statement that puts blame on everybody else but herself. She comes up with endless inconsistencies, unsupported with corroborating evidence, circumstances, and frankly, attacks on her deceased husband. It is our purpose, Mr. Becker and I, that this is not domestic court. We're interested in the weekend and what she is doing on March 10th, March 11th, and March 12th of 2007. We will tell you, we will, by our evidence, prove that Major Herrig, who served since slightly after 18 years of age in the Air Force Reserve, the 9th Camp, was also a Southwest pilot. And his last weekend of life, and they had a rocky marriage, it lasted two years, the 30th of June, 2005, met online, he was divorced for some years, had two children, he flies to New York to see her, within a two months or three month period, they're married, and she comes to Newton Falls. That marriage does not work out. And witnesses concerning the facts surrounding the elements of the crime will be our witnesses. We will show that Major Herrig was leading her 
in Newton Falls, he lived in a nice three-story <clears throat> split up the jury went to. The scene will be coming for them. And they had lived there together. She was a native of Brazil and became an American citizen. She had been married for 10 years to a doctor in New York. She divorced him and didn't kill him. <coughs> Objection to staying in disregard of those cases. <coughs> when he is in preparation to leave that weekend, Witnesses, including Gary Dodge, who is a colonel in the Air Force, longtime friend of Carl. Dan Henry, another pilot, longtime friend. They're with him, with him before he dies. And he expresses to them, I'm leaving her at this period, that weekend. And Dan Henry, about a week before, is with Carl, and they would go out together, and that time, they went target practice. He had a variety of guns. And on the way home, he says, I want to show you where I'm going to go live, on Broad Street. She's going to get the house to stay. I'm leaving her and we're going to go through a divorce. Uh, Gary Dodge said, good friend, he says, you can come to Astor Buell if you need a place to stay. His intent was to leave her with that house and he was moving out. That was his intent the weekend he died and before. Mr. Becker will have a witness, a man by the name of Schreckengoss. That, I think, he's going to be brought in. He's Elderly gentleman, uh, we need to assist him. On the 23rd of February, Carl went over and gave him 100 bucks. Got a key to a very small place, like an A-frame carriage house, he described. That was Carl's intent. Carl, as a Southwest Air Force pilot, and a Air Force Reserve employee, was scheduled on Wednesday the 13th, the 14th, to go to the air base, and he missed work. We're going to show that he was flying from New York to North Carolina, and he was in the air working for Southwest that weekend. He didn't get home until Monday morning. Gary Dodge contacted the police, and his body was discovered on the 15th. We're going to establish beyond a reasonable doubt he was killed on Monday morning after he got done working. And I'm going to go through the evidence, the crime scene at that time. But I want you to put this in your mind. Prior calculation and design. We need to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. This woman shot him three times. Twice in the back and once in the head. We're going to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she ambushed him. That the version of the crime is supported by the physical evidence and it will stand the test of time forever in our opinion because of all the circumstances you will hear. Okay. We have 
This man, preparing to end a marriage, to leave the house and let her live in the house after less than two years of marriage on that weekend. While he's preparing to leave her, she's preparing to kill him that weekend. She's actually on Saturday going to the Slugmaster's shop in Braceville, which is not far from Newton Falls, and she had been there previously, looking for a weapon. She's looking for a weapon with hitting power. She's also looking for ammunition, and we will have witnesses from police to the forensic pathologist. She wanted bullets that would expand, hollow points. So he's out flying, doing his job. He's got $100 down, the evidence will show. And on Saturday, she goes and purchases a Smith & Wesson 357, five shot. And Mr. Becker will introduce a witness. By the name of Brian Martin. He worked at Slugmasters. He spent time with the defendant. She wanted something that fit her hands better. Women's grip. She also ended up getting a laser 357 on the handle. It was customized with a laser sight, 357, to fit her hand. And with ammunition, they had hitting power. She then goes to a shooting range. But I want to mention this. When she is that weekend, two days before his murder, she needs to sign forms. When you purchase a weapon, you need to show identification. Your ATF will get these records. We will have a person with these records. And she gave the name of Volpe, her first husband's name. Her license in Ohio was Claudia Harry. And she also filled it out. And if you do these forms for purchasing the firearms, they ask, where are you born? She puts down New York City. She makes no mention of being a Latino or from Brazil. With 357 in hand, she goes to a shooting range on the west side of Warren, on West Mon no longer in business. This is 2007, March 10th, 2007. Sees a guy by the name of Richard Slither. Slither, I'm doing it right, Mr. Becker? Slider. Slider. And he will describe that she came in and seemed pretty certain, in, as he recalls, 
And he gave a statement back, by the way, back in 2000. The police are going to these people because they learn about these witnesses. She left the murder weapon in the house. And so, as I describe this, I'm letting you know the chronological order is a little differently, but I'm trying to, in my best way I can, to explain this story of what happened. The story of the man flying, not knowing what would be at home for him. She target practices. And Slitter uh, talks to her about, you really want hitting power, maybe you want a 45. And she wants to buy that gun, but she bought $839 of 357 just before, and then she didn't have enough money, so he put it aside. A 45, a 357 with women's grip and laser. And this is 2007. This is right before this happens. We learned this as I go through the crime scene. Uh, she will give her first statement on an airplane and then in the sheriff's department saying that, you will listen to it, I was getting these weapons and target practicing at different distances uh, with this ammunition because I was going to commit suicide. Never to kill my husband. Her story comes a little later because her story is not in any way related to the reality of the crime scene and what happened that you will determine from the evidence. Let's go to the crime scene. Like I said, the friends from the air base he didn't show the responsible pilot for the Air Force. And Gary Dodge, his parents, Ed and Fran Herrick, who are Newton Falls lunchtime folks, go and they go through the back door, sliding door, on the afternoon of Thursday the 15th three days after he was killed. They go in and Carl's body is covered with a tarp and a blanket. There is stench in the house. There is lividity and clear evidence to the medical examiner that went there, Dr. Humphrey, Germany, that he had been there for some time. It will turn out he's been there since Monday. Let you know. Because she was not found by the police, they tried to find her. She left all kind of belongings. She got on a plane in Pittsburgh and abandoned the BMW family car, went to New York and went to Sao Paulo, like that, on Monday. She leaves him covered up to rot and goes back to Brazil. In fact, you will hear 
in part of her statement that she covered him up so he wouldn't be discovered and it will give her time to escape. You will hear that from her. The medical examiner, Dr. Humphrey German, who was one of the few in Ohio, we were blessed to have him, a very fair-minded forensic pathologist. Objection, Your Honor. Overruled. Died last year. Our witness, who was at the scene, did the pathology report, took photographs, died. The coroner, who wrote the coroner's verdict, died. The law provides a remedy to provide you evidence so justice can be done. The state hired a substitute witness, Dr. Joseph Fila, out of Cleveland. He works for the medical examiner's office in Cuyahoga County. We had to give him the records of Dr. Germanic, his report, his photographs, x-rays, and have him examine the evidence, and he will be a witness for us. And the current coroner is Dr. James, and he will come in and attest to the fact that the records that were given to the expert in Cleveland, that these were the records of Dr. German. Dr. German, as a forensic pathologist, when somebody is killed, often would go to the crime scene. So here we are, the afternoon of the 7th, the 15th of March, having coroner's office, Newton Falls Police Sheriff's Department all investigate. And in that investigation, we come up with a variety of evidence which will comprise of our 91 exhibits, much of it. It led to the arrest warrant in April. It led to the things that were done internationally by the witness that comes in by the name of Bill Bolden to explain the sequence of events. But because of time, it became more difficult. Now, the crime scene. Mr. Becker, I'd like to There's a home. You viewed it today. Uh, witnesses will attest that there are some changes. Uh, for example, the important area that we believe you need to look at would be the, the stair area going from the bedrooms upstairs to the first floor. This is a tri-level, split-level home. Evidence will show. And the stairs comprise of 10 steps. Now, Mike Minucci will testify, uh, Peter Pizzullo was the sheriff's deputy will testify, that they were there with Dr. G, Dr. Germany, collecting the evidence at the crime scene. We also have a body that's taken to the morgue and there's bullets removed from the body. Those bullets go to a laboratory in BCI Richfield. And like I told you previously, she bought the 357. She used the 357. And we're going to find that the bullets in the body 
in the bullets that were analyzed at BCI come from the gun that she purchased two days before she left him to go to Brazil. By the way, on Saturday, she also transferred $9,900 out of her account to send to her father. And by the way, on Monday around noon, she gets another note. So, she's taking out the money, she's leaving town, her husband's dead, under a tarp. And I want to go through that crime scene, because she's going to give you a story that doesn't match the crime scene. And I think you're going to go through that story of contradictions, uh, things that don't matter, but nonsensical positions that don't match reality and she in fact changes her mind <clears throat> during the statement when confronted with facts that the crime scene showed and she didn't have. The crime scene speaks volumes. That's the house. Now, let's go to the next photograph. This plays a very important role, this suit. There are two vehicles in the, the household. We know Claudia was driving the BMW because it was at the Pittsburgh airport where she used her husband's pass as a Southwest Airlines pilot to go to New York went to LaGuardia and then went to uh, Kennedy and then got a ticket. Paid Cas and went down to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Same day. That's what the evidence will show. That's what she, she will admit. That car had three guns in it. He had some guns in his house. And he also had his, his night bag uh, with his personal clothing because he just got done with the trip. He was out of shape. He went to New York, North Carolina. He went around. He was weak. Uncomfortable. This, this man was just going home Monday morning. She agrees with that. Now, there's a part of her statement where she says that, you know, Carl would take the guns from me because I was suicidal at times, to protect them. <laughs> or, we don't know, Carl's not here. In the end, maybe protect himself. You can infer what you can from this evidence, because we don't know what was going on in the house when he was preparing to leave that month, Monday morning as far as what he was doing, except for what she tells you, and I believe you're going to find all the evidence, much of it is not true. But one thing's for certain, those guns were away from her in that trunk when he was killed, from our view of the evidence. And another thing is certain, Carl Herrick didn't know she had a 357 that morning. Leaving. Guns in the car that he has. She's got a gun, 357 Holocaust. His body is found at the bottom of the steps. Those steps, 10. This man along with Pete Pizzullo in the corner, are going to look at that crime scene, take photographs, send evidence that's relevant to BCI. 
And what do we find about the bottom of the set that's important? Mr. Becker, please. Next photograph. I encourage you to, that was the view of Carl Herrick, major in the Air Force, 43, 43 years of age, at 1230 on March 15, 2007. That's how she left. And you really don't see much there, do you, folks? And she wanted some time to get away. Let's go to the next photo. <clears throat> That's all. Important things to look at. This is 2007. This is when he's first discovered. He is across the steps. He does not have his shoes on. One of the shoes is under. I'm sorry, sir. this is all arguments and not anything to do with the opening statements. What they're Your Honor, I, I really beg I'm going to overrule that. Proceed with Mr. Watkins. Let's let's put it all. The facts will show that that man had his shoes off. There's a bottle, and one shoe was under him, and he strides across the bottom of the steps. There's 10 steps. Now, when you have a crime solved, certain things aren't released to anyone, even the public. The photographs of the crime scene, it's a criminal investigation. The autopsy report detailing the theories, the BCI reports, until the case is brought to trial in orders us to give the defense discovery and, and try, as this court did in this case, and was able to achieve having a jury. And most of you recognize in your answers, the less you know, the better it is. That's why you're here. Now we get to tell what we think our evidence is going to show. It's our belief that Carl Herrick and Experts will testify, including doctor, and mainly it, it is one expert is going to be able to testify as to how these shots occurred in angles, but there will be a second trooper gesture that will help with the angles of the bullets that were fired. There are two different sites where she assaulted and killed her husband. She shot him from the top of the stairs as he was putting his shoes on and she also went down and shot him at the bottom of the stairs. And I'll get to that after I go through this. How do we know that? You will see from the evidence that the wound to the right side basically is temple. And there will be more photographs. It's a contact wound, 12 inches to 24 inches away. There's spickling from that gunfire close to your head. It's also important that our evidence will show from the police that on the other side, of his head, that this bullet wound was through and through. That is, the bullet that went through his head exited the other side of his head and was in the floor and retrieved and ballistically shown to be her gun. Close, right to the head. Last shot. The reason that we say it's the last shot, our expert will say, Dr. Thilo, that that bullet was through and through, and the bullet was recovered on the other side of his head and exited. 
it was taken out, the ballistic was shot. You had to put that gun right up to them. They have this contact, the split, the spit lean, gunshot residue. It's, it's like blistering that occurs when the gun's close to you and reaches your skin. That shot was downstairs. Now, let's go to the next one. You got two wounds in the back. A and B in the autopsy report and the photographs that you will see. The first wound, A. Dr. Fila will say it was coming down and is consistent with somebody shooting from the top of the stairs as somebody would be, as we believe he was, sitting, putting his shoes on with his back to the upstairs. You also have two strings, and we can go to the next one. This one, A, upstairs, 357. This one goes down through his chest a order and does not exit the body because Dr. Thiel would say, if you're laying down, and he believes it's consistent, he believes that's what happened, that B, he was shot, and then the angle you hit C, it's like bang, bang, both shots downstairs, and the reason the two shots occurred downstairs is because the bullet was on the on his chest, and because he was laying on the floor, it didn't exit his chest. The A bullet, we believe, came from upstairs as she ambushed him with the one shot in the back. So, statements what the evidence shows, not what he believes. Proceed. Again, Dr. Filo is going to testify to this. Now, could we go to the next photograph, please? This is in 2007. <coughs> You're going to hear testimony from uh, the officers, Pazuo in particular, that, the, that there were two shots that missed, uh, and therefore they went into the basement and the angle in order for those bullets, they would be coming down uh, from this location and Trooper Jester will explain as an expert how at least three shots were shot upstairs. One for sure hit him, disabled him, incapacitated him, put him down like that, and she pursued him from all our evidence from upstairs and went down and finished him off. It's important in proving prior calculation and design that you consider the preparation, buying the guns, where is the man located, the victim, What's the distance between them two, between the two, and how many shots are fired? And if you pursue a helpless human being and go down the steps, you got to straddle him and go on the other side, bang, bang. That's prior calculation and design. Objection. In uh, our you're, you're arguing, Mr. Watkins, back to opening statement. Please. Thank you. In our opinion, that is part of calculation. Objection. Let's just state your objection. Could you just ask him to go forward. Again? Could you say that again? Stop. Go back and continue your opening statement. Thank you, Your Honor. So, 
I need to wind down a little bit here because I don't have much time. I try to go through what I believe is important evidence that Mr. Becker and I are going to bring out with that crime scene, the shots, leaving him, covering him up, and going to Brazil. Now, crime scene. Basically gave you all the evidence through most of the witnesses. Didn't deal with 11 years later. I'm going to deal with that right now. Sure. You'll hear from two federal law enforcement, law enforcement officials, Tony Santa and Bill Bolden. Bill Bolden's U.S. Marshal, and in order to extradite people who commit crime in Ohio that are in another country, Ohio doesn't do it. We need to go to our federal government. That is the U.S. Marshal's office. And he obtained in 2007, through Peter Elliott, United States Marshal for Northern District of Ohio, a federal fugitive warrant. And it took from 2007 to January 17, 2018, for him to get the call, come down to Brazil, go to Brasilia's airport, and we will meet you, federal police, and we're going to hand her over to the federal officials. And that was done. On the plane, these officers will tell her, they told her, it's not our case. We're just bringing you back. She says, and volunteers, a pretty consistent, we never heard from her for 11 years. And she says, you know, a wife does not kill a husband unless there's good reason. You don't need to talk. They don't ask any questions because they're not authorized. And then she runs down a story of what happened that's going to be inconsistent with the crime scene. That, in our opinion, doesn't make sense. That story is told on an eight hour to nine hour flight on the 17th. She was anxious to tell her son. Come. He took a shower after we had an argument. I was pregnant, and he didn't want the baby. And he goes, she goes into with him these prior uh, scenarios of all the problems in the marriage. And he says, so I, I wait for him when he takes a shower, and he comes out, and I have a gun to my head, and I say, I want to kill myself. And he said, he pushed me down. This is an airport military pilot. She's got a 357 in her hand as he comes out of the shower. This is what she says. He pushes me down and then says to me, there's paintings upstairs, if you want to kill yourself, go downstairs, I don't want blood on my paintings. And she says, you'd be alive. He didn't say that to me. You both kill myself. And, and you will hear from her because she says similar things in the video statement. And so she says that the gun is in my hand like this. He grabs me, throws me down, puts the hand on the gun. 
lets me keep the gun and says, go kill yourself downstairs. And she says, he let her keep the gun. Makes no sense, in our opinion, from the evidence. And then she says, from her version that you will hear, that he is walking away, walking away from the bedroom area. He was in that master bedroom, just took a shower, opened the door. She's, I want to kill myself. And he grabs the gun, pushes her down, and lets her keep the gun. And she gets very angry. And he's walking on the stairs, to the stairs to go down. We submit this did not happen. But this is what she did. Your Honor, from the evidence, we submit it did not happen. Thank you, Your Honor. She says that she took three quick shots and he tumbled down the stairs. That didn't happen. She gave consistent versions throughout until there's a point where she was cross-examined about or examined by Mikey Nucci. Well, there's a contact wound here. And they said, well, it's possible I shot one down there. Dr. Filo will testify that this man never fell down any steps. This man, and we believe from the evidence, never turned his back because he was downstairs when he was shot and ambushed. There was no blood on the top steps. There was no injuries consistent with falling down steps. She, from our evidence, committed aggravated murder by shooting her husband in cold blood three times, twice downstairs, and then left the United States. And we are here to present to this court that evidence, and we believe that we will prove beyond a reasonable doubt she is guilty of aggravated murder, the specification from the evidence in this case, and we thank you for your attention.